This morning's service, we were in Psalm 56. We were looking at David running for his life. Now we're going to be in Psalm 55, looking at David running for his life. I don't know, that just kind of seemed to be a theme that uh, I was kind of into. Uh, King David was, was uh, uh, picked by God. God said, Dave, I want you to be king. And he uh, selected him and sent a preacher to anoint him, which is basically pouring Crisco over his head until the oil dripped down his beard, which sounds really gross, but it was a kind of a ritualistic thing. And David was set apart as the king of Israel. Well, there was already a king of Israel, that was Saul, and he wasn't happy about the fact that God had picked another king while Saul was still the king. So there was, there was a lot going on in, uh, in, in, in uh, Psalm 56. He's running from the king of Israel, and there are very few places for him to hide. So he goes to a place called Gath. Now, if you remember your kids' Bible stories, Gath was where Goliath lived. So David ran to the very place that was filled with people who knew David, hated David, wanted to kill David. So he's running from a bunch of people who want to kill David, and he runs to a place filled with a bunch of people who want to kill David. It was a no-win situation. But in all of that, we looked at a couple of principles on how when your fear uh, is faced with faith, uh, how we look to the Lord, and it sounded like a, you know, pretty, uh, like a no-brainer church kind of talk, you know, trust Jesus, turn to Jesus, but uh, it, it's good advice, isn't it? When the bottom falls out of your spiritual life. So I guess what I'm going to throw out here is not much different than that, except in this message, he's not running away from King Saul. He's running away from his son. King David uh, finally ascended to the throne. Well, David, like a lot of the kings back then, had lots of wives, which is always a problem, I hear. With all of these wives comes lots of kids, lots of trouble, lots of problems. Well, one of David's sons, uh, uh, I, I think his name was, uh, shoot, I forgot his name now. But David had a daughter named Tamar. And David had a son named, do you remember his name? Uh, not Absalom, but uh, there was another son who, who, who had eyes for his half-sister, you know, stepsister. And he started to... And she said, oh, no, stay away. <clears throat> well, evidently, she said no. And the stepbrother thought, man, nah, no doesn't mean no. And he forced himself on her. And he, he attacked her. Well, her brother, Absalom, said, I'm going to kill this stepbrother of mine. And he did. So one of David's sons forces himself on one of David's daughters. Another of David's sons kills the first son who forced himself on the daughter. And that son, Absalom, who defended his, the honor of his sister and killed the stepbrother, decided, you know what? Uh, I've got some power around here. Well, the long and short of it is he kind of got booted out of the kingdom because David didn't stand up like the dad and deal with it as, as it seems like he probably should have he just kind of yeah no he didn't say boys will be boys but he basically you know I, there's not a whole lot i can do about it and he did nothing well in all of that uh absalom wasn't uh, punished he wasn't uh, killed uh, he was kind of exiled almost a self-imposed exile so for three or four years king david's son absalom is, is off by himself well during that time through uh, uh situations of intrigue and espionage and kind of you know little money here and a little fancy talk there he got a bunch of people to follow him and Absalom decided you know what I'm just gonna take the throne away from daddy I should be the king and so Absalom goes after King David to move him out of the way <coughs> you know what I mean <coughs> Psalm 55 was written during that time all right so just quickly, we're going to be looking for answers uh, from the midst of our anguish when we're hurting. Huh? Psalm 55, then uh, Absalom, King David's much favored son. Uh, it, it's, it's the adversity from this son Absalom that's crushing the hope from David's life. Now, I hope you've never been in that situation, but I'm sure you've known of parents who have been heartbroken by their kids. Huh? Now, as your kids get older, you don't have to worry about them as much, right? You worry about them more, don't you? And you wear out more knees in your pants as the kids get older because there's not a whole lot more you can say. I mean, I've done all my verbal abuse while they were growing up, and they know now. they got their own cars. They can drive away whenever they want. And 
So how much influence do you have? So you, you share as you can, but now your kids, they've got their own families, and, and now your kids have got kids, and so you've got grandkids, or if you're old like me, great-grandkids. I don't have great-grandkids yet, do I? Okay, I'll stop with the grandkids. But you still worry about them, and you still care about them, and you still pour your heart out. David, in the midst of that concern, felt his heart being crushed, not just because he was concerned about them. He was about to be killed by them. I don't know that any of us have been in that situation. But the adversity threatening to crush you may come from family, huh? may come from a friend, may come from a foe, someone who just hates you, it may just be from the frustrations of life, which can be pretty over overwhelming. Huh? But in all of that, uh, let's take a quick look at, uh, at how David handled it and maybe something that, that uh, is going to be able to help us out. If you're not going through a tough time now, hang in there. Give it a couple days. You will need this. Don't let your depression... What depression? Stop there. You don't get depressed when you're having a hard time, do you? Is it just me? Do you ever feel bad when you're having a bad time? Or are you like one guy I worked with? He went out to, to lunch. We used to work together in two-man teams. Well, this one particular day, I worked in the shop. This is back in the oldies when I had a real job. I was working at the sign shop, and, and uh, we were inside the shop, and he, we ate lunch. He went out to his truck to get something, found out someone stole the battery from his pickup truck. He had just been saved a couple of months, my buddy, and when he found out they stole the battery from his pickup truck, now, I wouldn't have said bad words because I was a Christian, but I wouldn't have been happy about it. He came in and said, praise the Lord, they stole my battery. Well, that's more spiritual than, spirituality than I have, you know what I mean? I tend to get upset when the apple cart is upset. I tend to not feel good when things are not going so good. You know what I mean? But if you are moved past this is not so good to the place where you just can't think of anything else, to the place where you just, oh, to the place where it not only affects your mind, but it's starting to affect your posture. You know what I mean? Where you just, oh. Don't let your depression keep you from talking to God, especially if you feel abandoned by God. Listen to David. Listen to my prayer, O oh God. Please do not ignore my plea. Hear me, God. Answer me, God. My thoughts trouble me, and I'm distraught. Don't let your depression keep you from talking to God, especially if you feel abandoned by God, especially if you feel abuse from people. Have you ever felt abused by people? I mean, in, in most cases, uh, Lauren and I have a favorite phrase, no good deed goes unpunished. Yeah. Uh, you, you try to help, you try to do, and... Doggone, it never works out. It always ends up costing more money. And, you know, you tried to do a good thing, and, oh, now you're, you're stuck, or you, you don't know how to help. And, but worse than that, you actually do it, and you feel unappreciated. You ever felt unappreciated every time? Yeah. Worse than that, you not only, it not only didn't work out, and you don't feel appreciated, but now they're abusing you like it was your fault. Yeah? That's where David was. Don't let depression keep you from talking to God, especially if you feel abandoned by God, especially if you face abuse from people. Because of what my enemy is saying, David says, because of the threats of the wicked, they bring me down. They bring suffering down on me, and they assail me in their anger. He not only felt uh, abandoned by God and abused by people, but he felt agony in his suffering. Evidently, it's possible to hurt and hurt real bad. You know what I mean? It's possible to feel like, wow, this is tough. I can't wait to get out from under this. And then to be at the place where you're under the gun, you're under the pressure, you're under the crush, and you feel like, man, I'm never going to get out of this. And it starts affecting everything. You, you just can't not think about it. David said in verse 4, my heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling constantly fill my mind and my heart. They beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. So what do you do? Well, this is easy. I'm a preacher, and so you pay me a lot of money to say this stuff, so I'll just say it, okay? Talk to God in spite of your depression. Well, it's kind of an easy thing to say. But I see in David's life, David was about to be killed by his son. He wasn't just being unappreciated by his son. He was about to be killed by his son. Talk about depressed. David was overwhelmed, he said. He was beset, like captured. He was overwhelmed, like when you can't get out of bed, you can't even pull the covers past your head. You know what I mean? He was overwhelmed, and he still talked to God. So maybe that's a, that's a good place to start, huh? Talk to God in spite of your depression. Verse 6, I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. Oh, I would fly away and be at rest with you, God. 7, I would flee far away and stay in the desert. I would hurry to my place of shelter far from the tempest and the storm. I implied with God because he's talking to God. It's implied that he's talking to God because that's the only place he can find hope. 
Uh, most of us pray to God for help. There's nothing wrong with that. But when we start growing up in the Lord, you start growing up in the Spirit, and you get beyond the ABCs of the truth, of the faith, it's not wrong to ask God for help. But you move beyond that. You're not just trying to squirm out from under the struggle anymore. You're not just trying to get enough money to, to have left at the end of the month. You're not just trying to get out from the hurt. Now you're actually trying to figure out, God, what do you want me to learn from this? God, you could have stopped this. God, what do you want me to get out of this? So talk to God in spite of your depression. That's the point. He's, he's letting you come closer to God. I'm not as spiritually sensitive as most of you. God kind of leads me. Lauren talked about open doors, closed door. God kind of leads me the way scientists do lab rats, you know, going through the maze. You know, I can smell the cheese, and I'm just going to keep bumping into walls until I find an opening. <laughs> and I'll run faster. Do I have the openings? And then I hit another closed door, another wall, another wall. But I can still smell the cheese, baby. <laughs> and it smells like nachos. And I keep going. <laughs> then I'll hit another wall because God doesn't speak to me. I mean, he doesn't speak to me. And I, I don't discern some kind of spiritual code when I read the Bible. And, oh, God's trying to tell. I just don't know. I know there's some things that are very clear. Reach people for Jesus. Help them become more like Jesus. That's the only thing I'm sure about. And for me, get saved and make sure I'm living like it, right? The rest of it, I'm just kind of just kind of bumbling my way through life. That's not a good thing to hear your pastor say, but when you don't know where to go, when you don't know where to turn, turn to him. I know it sounds simple, but I think some of us forget. It's not a matter of running to him just to get out from under the misery. Get together with him so that you can move back into that process of maturity because he's growing you up. So, one, don't let your depression keep you from talking to God. Two, don't let your exasperation keep you from turning toward God. Uh, you know what exasperation is? Basically what I am most of the time. Not really. Exasperation is you're just at the, ah, ah, everything is, ah, and you don't even know where you're going because I'm the little mouse looking for the cheese and I can't find the opening, so, ah, ah, that's the way exasperation sounds, by the way. In Hebrew, ah, in Greek, ah, in Spanish, ah, it all sounds the same. And it looks pretty much like me most of the time. When you call it down, Usa, Usa. Right, Jonette? Jonette used to, where are you, Jonette? Jonette, working for us years ago, I'd, I'd get, ah, I'd get, uh, not crunchy. What did I get, focused? Whatever they used to call me at the office when I'd get, ah! And Jonette would walk up to me and say, Usa, Mr. T, Usa. And she'd rub my ear to calm me down. Don't tell me to calm down. <laughs> when you get to the place where you just, ah, you know you've got to do something, but you don't know what. You know, I may be accused of doing the wrong thing, but I'll never be accused of doing nothing. Well, that sounds good, but it's not necessarily very spiritual. Because sometimes God wants you to just shut up and sit down. Uh, you, you know. Don't let your exasperation keep you from turning toward God. Verse 9, even when your communities are no longer secure. In David's situation, the enemy was not only just trying to kill him, they had overrun his beloved city. You ever feel like that? you live in the South Valley or the North or the Northeast Heights or the Southeast. doesn't matter where you live. Your communities are no longer secure. Lord, confuse the wicked. Confound their words. I see violence and strife in the city day and night. They prowl about on its walls. That would be I don't know what that was, but I'm going to get me some paint and try it. It looked pretty creative. Uh, day and night, they prowl about on its wall. Malice and abuse are within it. Destructive forces are at work in the city. Threats and lies never leave its streets. When your communities are no longer secure, when your comrades are no longer sensitive, you ever felt like you lost a friend? Have you ever felt like your friends no longer get you? They no longer understand you? They no longer have your back? Or at very least, they just don't understand what you're struggling with? David said at that point, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could handle it and I could hide. But it's you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, my homie, my brother, my body, my friend, someone who should understand me. I understand a friend giving me a hard time. I understand a friend trying to hurt me. I mean, a, a foe, but not a friend with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God. We used to walk about among all the worshipers. Look at us now, 15. Let death take my enemies by surprise. Let them go down alive to the realm of the dead. That's pretty wicked. God, send them to, you know where? H-E double hockey sticks. For evil finds lodging among them. So, 
Talk to God in spite of your depression. Turn to God in spite of your exasperation. Lord, confuse the wicked, confound their words. And number three, don't let your decisions keep you from trusting in God. Stop, look up here at me. The Old Testament talks a lot about, uh, there's a lot of warnings about uh, making rash vows, making foolish promises to God. Listen, I, I'm all in favor of you becoming people of integrity. You are becoming more people of integrity where all of the pieces of your life fit together. So they're not, you're not like, uh, was it Marvin the Martian in Bugs Bunny? I will have to disintegrate you with my ray gun. And when Marvin the Martian, remember with the push broom on his helmet, if you don't remember, when he'd point the ray gun to disintegrate someone, what happens when you shoot somebody with the ray gun that's going to disintegrate them? They disintegrate. When you're a person of integrity, all your pieces fit. So if you say this, but you're thinking that, uh, but if you say this and you're actually thinking that, it fits together. Everybody thinks you're like this, but really, you're like this. Uh, pieces aren't fitting together. In church, I'm all happy, happy, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and the rest of the week I'm exasperated. Ah! That's not me, but for pretend. Uh, you want to be a person of integrity. And then, uh, we had a guy in our other church who said, listen, I'm going to be honest. I'm not going to lie to you. Who I am is who I am, and that's why I keep my cigarettes right here. See? <laughs> well, you kind of missed the point. You're not trying to hide your ciggy smokes in church on Sunday morning. The point is, have it empty during the week, too, not full on Sunday morning. But at least he understood. To be a person of integrity is to make sure that your Monday life and your Tuesday life and your Thursday life and your Saturday night are the same as your Sunday morning life. Does that make sense? Be a person of integrity. When you make a decision that you find out down the road kind of puts you in the wrong position with God, I understand. I made a promise I need to keep it. I understand. But if it's a foolish promise, if it's a rash vow, go back to God, fess up and say, my bad, how stupid was I to say that, God? And he's probably going, what are you talking about? I don't know. You think God doesn't know it was a stupid promise? Yeah. Because the point is not just keep a promise. The point is let everything in your life Pleasant things, unpleasant things, because all things are good things. All things are working together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. So when the bottom drops out of your life, spiritual life, financial life, when life is tough, everything is still moving you in a direction where you can be that person of integrity. Spiritual integrity, not what you think is a person of integrity, not what I think is a person of integrity. What God thinks is a person of integrity. Let all the parts of your life line up, not just within you, but within him. Well, how are you going to know what he thinks? Well, I know what God knows. I know what God thinks. I know what God... Eh, read it. Do that. When you're doing what you do because he says what he says, then you're walking by faith. Walking by faith isn't because you think he wants you to go left. You think he wants you to stop. You think he wants you to buy that thing. You think he wants... Walking by faith is doing what you do because he says what he says, right? So three, don't let your decisions keep you from trusting in God. When struggle and sorrow overwhelm you, cry to the Lord. As for me, I call to God and the Lord saves me. Even in the morning, I cry out in distress and he hears my voice. He rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me, even though many oppose me. When struggle and sorrow overwhelm you, cry to the Lord, stand with the Lord. 19, God who is enthroned from old does not change. He will hear them and humble them because they have no fear of God. My companion attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. His talk is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. Careful, careful, careful. Don't be deceived by words that make you feel good. That doesn't mean everybody who says something nice to you is trying to get something from you. Just be careful. The wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. If someone is not out for your best interest, they will be used to take from you by the world, by the flesh, by the devil. You want to surround yourself with people who love the Lord more than you do. Now, if they're smart, they won't hang out with you, but you want to surround yourself with people who love the Lord more than you do. Why? Because you want them to pull you closer to the Lord. If you surround yourself with people that you're more spiritual than, and then some people you're kind of stuck with, right? 
But if you surround yourself with people that you're more spiritual than, that's poor grammar, but you get what I'm Guess what's probably going to happen? More than likely, you will not turn them. More than likely, they will taint you. You need to surround yourself. The people you hang with, the people you play with, the people you work with, if at all possible, don't spend time with them, an unbeliever, unless you're trying to lead them to the Lord. Ah, that sounds so horrible, doesn't it? You can't even, can't even have fun with somebody. Well, of course have fun. But it's really not fun if they die and go to hell, and then they're looking at you from hell wondering, how come you didn't say anything that hour and a half we hung out together? Why didn't you say something? Why didn't you tell me? Well, we were having too much fun. What are you going to say? Every moment you have with an unbeliever is an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. I know it sounds like a big old Billy Graham thing here, but it's all about leading people to Jesus. It really is. 19, God, you're enthroned from old. You do not change. You hear in humble. They have no fear of God. My companions attack his friends. He violates his covenant. His talk is smooth as butter. Yet war is in his heart. Careful when people just tell you what you want to hear. Careful when people just tell you what you want to hear. There are some things you need to hear, right? When struggle and sorrow overwhelm you, lean on the Lord. 22, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. But you, God, will bring down the wicked into a pit of decay. The bloodthirsty and deceitful will not live out half their days. But as for me, I will trust in you, God. Look, when the hurt is heaped up, when it, when, when it feels like life is dogpiling on top of you, God still wants us to let our feelings force us into the arms of our Heavenly Father. Life tends to want to push you away from God. You position yourself in such a way that if you get pushed, you get pushed in that direction. This is going to sound kind of bad. I'll tell you what a bad driver I am. But when I'm at an intersection, I'm about to make a left-hand turn or about to make a U-turn, I try as hard as I can to remember, and I'm usually pretty good at it, when I'm in the median, I'm, I'm about to make a U-turn or a left-hand turn, I try not to let my wheels be turned to the left. Why is that? When I get rear-ended, which way is my car going to go? Well, nine times out of ten, it's probably going to go in the direction that my wheels are turned. So I try to keep my wheels lined up straight. That's not going to help. I totaled out one of mom's cars one time because, well, never. that's a whole other story. But it doesn't always work. But I think it's right when you're in an intersection, when you're in life, you have no control over what next thing in life is going to rear-end you. You have no idea. Do everything you can to position yourself, turn the steering wheel of your life in such a way that when life just rams your nanner, whatever that means, it pushes you closer to God, not farther from Him. If that makes any sense at all, then you go, girl. Don't let your depression keep you from talking to God. Don't let your exasperation keep you from turning to God. Don't let your decisions keep you from trusting in God. He wants us to turn to Him. He wants us to trust Him. He wants us to follow Him, doesn't He? What are the first steps? Well, duh, get saved. Give your life to Jesus. If, if this is your first time, your first time here, we talk all the time about giving your life to the Lord. We talk about blue books until we are blue in the face. Thank you very much. At that black column, at this black column, and at the door, you'll find blue books. So just little blue books just to tell you how simple it is to open your heart and give your life to Jesus Christ. The easiest thing you'll ever do, the most difficult thing you'll ever do, to turn loose of your life. Give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Two, if, if you really give your heart and life to Jesus, guess who your heart and life belong to? Uh... And the next thing he wants you to do is to get baptized. Our next baptism is whenever the second Sunday, so not next Sunday, but the following Sunday, I believe. Does that sound right? Yeah, we'll be baptizing. Saved, soaked, and then make sure you're serious. Living your life like you want it to count for Jesus Christ. If there's anything we can do, talk to us. Take advantage. In your program, there's a blue tearaway. Your name and email address, name, phone number, just let me know. Hey, could you pray for me? Or, hey, I really need to talk to you. Someone this morning said, hey, I'd like to talk to you this week. Can we set up a time? Yeah, somebody else came to me, brought a blue book. Hey, I prayed and gave my life to the Lord this week, and they want to be baptized in two weeks. I, that, that's, that's what I, this is why I live. This is why I breathe. When you come and you ask me questions about some crazy guy you're listening to on the radio, or some goofball you listen to online, oh, that would be me. I was thinking about this. Somebody was talking about come to think of it. But you're listening to stuff. I, I, I don't know that I know more than you, but generally I'm like half a step ahead because I'm trying to impress you. I, I know a little bit. God wants iron to sharpen iron. If there's anything I can do to help you reassess and, and reaffirm, recommit where you are in the faith, not just to continue to think like you think, not just to continue to do what you do, but if you really are serious about growing in the Lord, that's what I do. I want to help you, okay? 
I want to help you. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, Lord, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Lord Jesus, change us, fill us, speak to us. God, give us everything we need to take the next step, whatever, whatever that next step is, to get saved or, or to quit doing something or to start doing something or to pick a new group of friends or to keep the group of friends we have or to start being friendly or to quit being friendly. God, whatever you want us to do, God, show us how to protect ourselves that we might be positioned for you so that whenever you're ready for us, our steering wheel of life is pointed in your direction. God, I pray that no one who hears this message this morning will go away unprepared for the hurt of life. God, I pray that they would realize that no suffering, no struggle can pull us away from you, can pull us away from your love. God, help us realize that no matter the situation, it is well, it is well with our soul. When peace like a river attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well with my soul Would you like to sing with me? It is well with my soul
Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for being so good. Change us, use us. In your name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless.